everyone. I'm Dr. Lulu from Fathamala Medical College and I will be taking the session on communication skills with a focus on scenario training as part of the uh, COVID-19 advanced ICU training organized by RGUHS and Jeevaraksha. So I just want you all to reflect on this picture here. This is just a uh, 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 picture we took during one of our training programs just before the students went for lunch. So when you reflect on this, um, I want to give you the context. There is a written communication here mentioned, please keep the footwear inside. Verbally, we had informed them before they went for lunch, kindly keep your footwear in the racks. But still you can see, um, you know, there was no effective communication, right? Because it's not implemented. So when you look at this picture, what, what, what do you think or why do you think that the communication was ineffective, even though there was a verbal communication, there was a written communication? So what I want you to reflect on is that there are a lot of factors involved. Probably the children were hungry, so they just left it and went. Probably the first person left it outside and everyone followed suit. And probably this is not a, a, they didn't consider it that serious an event, like, you know, what's going to happen. Or some are just, uh, you know, they just forgot the communication. So there are a lot of human factors and other factors involved where your communication is ineffective, even though you feel you have communicated well. So when you come to the healthcare system, our main concern is patient safety, right? And right now, yes, even our own safety, healthcare provider safety. But when we look at a complex healthcare environment where patient safety is our concern, we want our communication to be effective, right? Now, at the same time, considering what's happening around presently during the pandemic, as well as even before that, what about our safety? So even for our safety, we need to ensure that the communication is effective because in the healthcare system, we are communicating with so many disciplines, so many members. Uh, for one patient, you will have to talk to the nutritionist, you will have to talk to the dietitian, you will have to talk to the physiotherapist, the security, the administrators, the nurses, the nursing aides, the orderlies. And imagine if it's a critical care environment, right? So with that background, I want to stress on the fact that communication, if ineffective, is responsible for majority of the healthcare errors, either due to lack of communication or miscommunication. And it is a teachable and learnable skill, unlike what, you know, the, okay, you're born to talk, he's a talkative person, oh, I, he knows English properly, okay. Uh, uh, so effective communication is a teachable and a learnable skill and there are structured tools for communication especially in the healthcare context which will enhance patient safety and try uh, to help us to overcome a few barriers which are present in a healthcare environment like time factor or you know noisy background there's a lot of physical and uh, internal and external uh, barriers uh, in the healthcare system which prevent us from communicating effectively and 80% of the healthcare errors documented under patient safety research is due to lack of communication or miscommunication. And among those, 80% is during handoff, either night shift, day shift, or between uh, units and wards being, uh, patients are being transferred. So this is a major concern for us, and that's the background of today. Now let's come more specifically to a critical care environment. Now, if you look at this picture, again, I want you to reflect on what do you think the challenges are for an effective communication in such a context? There's a COVID positive patient who's complaining of sudden breathlessness and you have a ward nurse who's fully dressed in PPE. Now there will be challenges for communication because she's in PPE and obviously we all know that PPE is a huge barrier to effective communication now. The uh, patient is breathless. She may be hypoxic. She might not comprehend as to what you're telling her. She may not understand. And a noisy ward is also another challenge. What about this 
This is another instance during critical care where as a healthcare provider, we need to communicate with the patient bystander. And it comes with added challenges of communication with, um, um, you know, uh, a, a bystander who may be uh, volatile, may not comprehend what you're saying, may be defensive. And there's a lot of other issues where this is a little critical area where effective communication and how to communicate conflicts will be there on how to prevent uh, mishap from happening to you as well as uh, to the better prognosis of the patient, effective communication over here. And this is something where uh, uh, I will be again discussing upon the empathy component involved during communication in a critical care environment. Now, what about this scene? during critical, it's a proper ICU. What are the challenges here? Again, the PPE challenges, a lot of noise from our monitors, from our ventilators. And this is another area where during handoff, we have miscommunication. And you need a, a crisis can happen here, sudden SATs falling, sudden uh, hypertension happening, you're trying to intubate the patient and you're not able to, you're not, uh, not able to put a cannula, you know, these uh, sort of things where emergency and crisis is there and very, very crucial where you need structured tools for effective communication, where probably a team leader needs to uh, convey a message to the healthcare team where everyone is having a shared mental model as to what is happening with the patient, uh, where our plan is going, do we need to go to a plan B, and so and so forth. Now, the objectives of this session, uh, hopefully after listening to this session, uh, you will be able to enlist the structured tools for effective communication. I will be discussing uh, most commonly used tools and uh, evidence-based effective uh, tools in healthcare environment. Uh, and obviously by now, because of the previous reflection, you would have already appraised the need for advocating effective communication with empathy in a critical care environment. And since this is a TOT on how to uh, demonstrate good facilitation skills in teaching and assessing uh, effective communication during scenario training. So a little bit about scenario training towards the end of the session, I will be discussing. So now how do we communicate? You, we, I already mentioned to you about the written communication, the verbal. There's also a component of the uh, non-verbal uh, component. So uh, from this picture, it's quite evident that what we say is uh, only 7% of how we actually communicate and it's more of non-verbals and uh, uh, the paraverbals. And you would, as teachers or as healthcare providers with all, a lot of online sessions going on, you will realize how much we miss these non-verbals. And especially with the mask and the face shield available, uh, uh, again, verbal is uh, masked, a little more uh, ineffective, where we need to actually uh, try to use gestures or, you know, some other form of placards or written communication to enhance the efficacy of our communication. At the same time, I want to stress on active listening. Uh, uh, when I'm talking to you, I presume you know, uh, you know what I'm talking, but unless I have a response from you that you're actively listening, either by your body language or by your paraphrasing or, you know, where you're summarizing and letting me know that you've understood what I'm trying to uh, tell you, uh, that is an important component of uh, communication, which is active listening. And during the COVID era, as already mentioned, these are the uh, issues we need to uh, think of. Now, coming to structured tools for communication before we jump on to the scenario training. Now, I'll broadly classify as, okay, we need to talk to patients, we need to talk to the family members. And yes, in a critical care environment, especially we need to talk to a healthcare team. Now, these are the two protocols I will just orient you all to. One is the class protocol while talking to patients and even family members. And one is the spikes protocol, which is again, uh, can be used for breaking bad news and class protocol is used for clinical interviews. With the healthcare team, 
Uh, most important is closed loop, which is also known as check back, where especially during a crisis management, you know, we need to ensure that uh, the sender is communicating well and the receiver has, uh, you know, is responding the same message that was conveyed. And an important tool, a lot of literature available on ISPAR, where you can use this very effective tool both for escalating uh, an emergency to your supervisor, your senior, or even your colleague, and also during handoff. So what is a class protocol? Now, this is an acronym where, imagine in the critical care environment, you are first going to take care of the C, that is the context. So when you think of an ICU, you're talking to the patient party uh, and you are uh, explaining the prognosis or a daily brief up, you need to be very clear about your physical setting, uh, not to speak to them in the corridor or, you know, just outside where other patients. So provide some privacy. There is a counseling room available. And uh, considering the present context, uh, there are CCTV cameras and counseling room to uh, make sure that we have explained the prognosis to the uh, patient party to record those uh, conversations, definitely with consent. Coming to L, you need to be an effective listener to the queries you're asking, okay, to the history you're taking or to the concerns the patient is telling you. The patient or the patient party uh, talking to you, you need to acknowledge, validate their concern, explore further, probe further, and also at the same time, bring in the component of empathy where you're addressing their emotions and concern. I know in a critical care environment, time is a factor, but this is a huge component where we can ever, uh, you know, avoid uh, 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 a code violet or somebody actually coming to catch your caller. Once uh, this is clear, we move on and we explain to them the strategy or, you know, a management plan of uh, what the patient needs to do or the patient family needs to do and make sure that it is in a language that the patient can understand. And then you summarize and you also tell the patient or the patient party or the family to, you know, read back to you or check back to you as to what you have told them so that you are clear that what you have spoken is what they have comprehended or understood. So this is a simple acronym class, which will, uh, which tool you can use for clinical interviews and talking to patients and patient family. So context, listening skills, acknowledge strategy and summary now coming to a tool for breaking bad news so breaking bad news need not always be a death it can also be for some morbidity it can be anything related to financially uh, or anything which uh, you know is going to uh, uh, affect the patient's uh, prognosis for a normal or a quality care living now, in an ICU, definitely you need a tool and Spikes Protocol is a very commonly used tool to break bad news. Again, setting is very important. You are going to be the worst person in that person, in that patient's or patient family's life that day. Probably it is the thousand person you're, you know, breaking a bad news. But for that particular uh, patient or patient family, you are going to be a bad memory for them. So make sure the setting is okay. Uh, they are seated comfortably, water is available, or maybe, you know, uh, there is a female uh, 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 help or a female healthcare provider in case you need to uh, talk to a female uh, um, patient family. Uh, make sure there are some tissue papers or, you know, they are uh, and there's privacy. Your phone is uh, in a silent mode because this setting is very, very, important uh, before you move on. Now that is the S of the spikes. Coming to perception, how much does the patient or the patient family know about what's happening? Because you might be doing rounds today, yesterday somebody else did, day before somebody else did. So how much are they aware? So we first try to find out how much do they know of what's happening uh, about the patient condition. The I of the spikes is invitation. Now, sometimes you get an old mother or an old father who might not be able to comprehend. They want their son around or they want somebody else around, a relative. So, you know, you are going to ask them that whether they need somebody around because what you're going to tell them is not good. Okay, uh, I'm afraid I have uh, a bad news to tell you. Do you want somebody available or are you in a position to comprehend it? 
knowledge, the K is the part where you're actually breaking the bad news and you're telling them what the patient's condition is. Now, once you break that bad news, uh, you need to give a moment of silence because uh, the patient or the patient family might not be able to grasp what you're saying. They may be defensive. They may be emotional. They may burst out crying. They may deny. So there are a lot of emotions going on once you break the bad news. And this is where you need to give them an empathetic response, acknowledge, address their emotions. And then once they are settled, probably it might not be in the first sitting. You might have to go for another sitting. And then you tell them what is the next strategic plan or the, uh, you know, mode of management or what else can they do. And again, let them summarize as to what it is. Now, if it is a death, what else they need to do? Uh, because it's a COVID death or, you know, what are the formalities, whether you need them to talk to the nurse on what else to do, whether they have any rituals to perform uh, or, you know, so and so forth. If it's not yet, then for terminally ill, uh, what to do or uh, end of life care, you know, those sort of things will be a part of your strategy. So this is Spike's protocol, S for the setting. P for the perception, I for the invitation, knowledge where you actually break the bad news and your empathetic response and your summary and strategy. Now, these are the two tools which you can use with patients and patient. Like I said, effective communication also involves empathy. And this is one aspect where we can really avoid, you know, patient catching our callers. It, it it shows in our verbal, it shows in our non-verbal. So make sure that you see their world on how they see it. You un try to understand their feelings and you are actually communicating that you've understood how they are feeling. Okay, So this is an, a crucial part of uh, uh, an effective communication, especially with patient family. And now, coming to tools for... Uh, Effective communication with your healthcare team. It could be your colleague, it could be your junior and senior, it could be a nurse, it could be a physiotherapist, it could be a technician, it could be anyone in your healthcare team who are direct healthcare providers, or even it could be non-direct healthcare providers like the labs, the imaging, uh, the security outside, especially during a, a crisis. So ISBAR is a tool where we use I'm going to concentrate here on escalation and handoff. I, you introduce yourself, you introduce the patient uh, you're talking about, and you identify who you're talking to, especially when it's a phone call. Who are you talking to? They might be the same person with uh, uh, different persons with the same name. You don't know who you're speaking to, especially during handoff. Uh, you're transferring the patient to another center or another institute. So I here is very important. Identify the patient by name rather than bed number or, you know, a case file record number. Now situation. Why are you calling? Especially if you're escalating uh, an emergency, you're calling because you want to wake them up and you want them to pay attention to you. So you're calling because there is hypoxia. You're calling because there's hypotension. You're calling because the sats are falling. You're calling because there's bleeding from somewhere so this is the situation and if it's you're talking to the security or the administration you're calling because there is a violent mob now that is the situation you're calling about so once you tell them the situation and you've got their uh, you know uh, attention you give a background of which patient it was how they were and a brief background how they were admitted, what were the chief complaints and, you know, what's uh, uh, a little bit of, uh, if they knew, knew the patient, ma'am, this was the patient who got admitted two days back and the report came so-and-so, we connected to ventilator this day, blah, you know, all that is comes in the background. And then you have the A, which is the assessment. Now, assessment, an easy way to do the assessment before you ring up somebody or before you call up or hand off is the A, B, C, D, E. So when you are explaining before you phone, just note it down, A, B, C, D, airway. Is the patient intubated or is the patient on uh, non-invasive or what's happening to the airway? Okay, is it patent? Are there secretions? Is it blocked? You want somebody to come and intubate, you know? So speak about the airway. Under the B, 
it's the breathing. So you're going to talk about the saturation. You're going to talk about whether spontaneous breathing is there or not. You're going to talk about the ETCO2. You're going to talk about whether the patient is having mechanical ventilation or not. Everything and your respiratory rate. If there's any ABG report, you're going to talk about that. That all comes in the B part. C part is your circulation. Where, where is your heart rate, your pulse rate, your uh, uh, blood pressure um, and your ECG findings or any rhythm anomalies, everything related to the circulation, which also includes your intake output. Then you come to the D, disability, the pupils or the um, CNS level especially, uh, and which also includes your glucometer readings. And E is everything else, the drains, the tubes, uh, the rashes, the uh, uh, any allergic reaction, everything else, the temperature, everything comes there. So if you follow the A, B, C, D, E, it becomes very easy for you to complete your assessment as well as, you know, uh, uh, convey the information to uh, the person who you're calling. And that comes the R part. Now, in the R, based on your assessment, you are a healthcare provider, you know what's happening. So there is something that you want to request. I'm worried about the patient. Is fine enough. Can you please come and have a look? That is more than enough, you know, if you don't know what's happening. Or um, you think that there's bleeding or you think that there's uh, saturation. Should I change over to non-rebreathing? Should I keep the ventilator ready? Should I take an ECG by the time you come? These are the things you can recommend if you have an idea of what's happening with the patient. And then once the person you're calling uh, gives you orders, to do something, you are going to read back, especially important when they tell you the name of uh, drugs, where you need to spell out the uh, name, the dose, uh, what to keep ready, uh, what investigations to send for. And that is very important. So the R for ease of understanding, I have uh, broken it up into three uh, as recommend, request and read back. So I hope I'm clear with IS bar, is bar, please use it you know, uh, har bar, like, you know, like one of our uh, professors used to say. So ISBAR is one tool, even if you've not comprehended to anything I mentioned, make sure that you teach your trainees or your uh, uh, colleagues on using. During a crisis and even otherwise, closed loop communication, a lot of challenges for effective communication. And this is one very important tool where if I'm the sender, I clearly initiate a message to you. You let me know that you've understood and you send it back to me and we close the loop. So I may tell you during a cardiac arrest to give one milligram of adrenaline IV and raise the limb to flush the line. And you respond by saying, do you want me to give one milligram of uh, uh, adrenaline IV and then flush the line? I say, yes, you give. And then after giving you again, close the loop and let me know one milligram of IV adrenaline given. OK, so now not just you and me, everyone in the team is aware that, yes, this drug has been given. So that is how we close the loop. Now, again, call out is a tool which we do but i just want to stress it out here one person is intubating one person is um, putting the cannula one person is uh, trying to keep the ventilator ready one person is talking to the patient family and at the airway end you know you're trying to intubate you can't see the vocal cords so you're calling out to the team members to tell it's an emergency i cannot see the vocal cords can somebody you know call for a senior help or can somebody come and adjust the uh, uh, head in for me or put a shoulder roll behind uh, uh, the victim's shoulder you know that's so the everyone else knows what's happening is a call out during a uh, crisis management so these are uh, uh, the other tools uh, we can use with the healthcare providers too and see of the communication now uh, why one slide on styles of communication is because it's a critical care uh, environment and everyone is uh, on alert. Everyone uh, has a lot of human factors involved where, you know, the styles of communication also mean a lot. There will be a lot of conflicts between whether the same plan of management, hierarchical issues. Uh, do you know or I know I'm senior than you? A lot of issues are there. So the styles of communication on how you should communicate. You can be passive where you just take orders, you don't want to confront uh, and you're not, uh, no respect for yourself and you're not concerned for patient safety. 
You can be aggressive. You can have a fight with the person who's telling you to do so you don't respect them. And at the same time, you're not concerned about the patient. It's rather your ego. So you need to have an assertive style of communication where you're respecting yourself as well as the person you're speaking to and your prime uh, priority is concern for the patient. So this actually takes practice. But what I want to tell you is please try to use assertive styles of communication when you're talking because it's all about respect and patience. There will be conflicts. And it's not easy in one slide to teach you one tool to avoid those conflicts. But again, you have the cuss tool. Now, somebody tells you to give a drug or a dose or a plan of management where you are aware that it, that's not the right or you have a concern giving such a high dose. What do you do? You use the cuss protocol. You say, I'm concerned regarding this uh, plan of care. I'm uncomfortable implementing it or giving such a high dose because this is a patient safety issue. Now, when you use this CUS tool to the person talking to, obviously the person, you know, at first might not respond, but if you repeat it again, the two challenge rule, they will say, okay, so there must be something wrong in what I said. And, you know, he may pay attention and they can be once he explains to you that this is good for the patient. Yes, you can go ahead. Even if you're if you're not con convinced, you can as well escalate it to your supervisor, especially if you belong to two different disciplines. So this CUS tool is resolution so that was just an orientation for uh, y'all about what the tools were and you know um, a brief on uh, effective communication keeping the context of the uh, uh, covid icu uh, environment now since y'all are trainers i will tell you something about scenario training so to teach and assess communication one of the uh, uh, valuable tools we have is scenario training, a teaching learning method where, you know, we tell them to immerse themselves in the scenario and they're experiencing it. So it's an experiential education where you put them into the direct experience. We create an environment, we create a scenario and we just immerse the learners there and we guide them to observe. Now, even if they are not direct participants, the others observing, they reflect on how they perform. They reflect on their actions. And what is our goal is to close the gaps. If they don't have knowledge, yes, during the debrief, we explain it to them and their skills and their effective domain. So communication, um, uh, to teach and assess communication, this is a very important tool, which is synapse. Now, uh, probably Jeeva Raksha will give you all the scenario already done. You know, there'll be facilitator guides. But if you happen to be one of the instructors who wants to prepare your own scenario, how do you go about it? So you have the ADI model where uh, I'm just going to be brief. So first you analyze what are the gaps, you know, which gap you want to cover. Is it breaking bad news or is it escalating the matter, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of communication. So you analyze who your learners are. Are they nurses? Are they doctors? Are, is, it, is it an uh, interprofessional crowd? Uh, you know, so who are you trying to assess? So your needs assessment falls here as to what gap you're closing and who your target learners are. And then you design your lesson plan. Here is where you write out your objectives, not more than two to three objectives, where you, you actually want them to demonstrate effective communication using IS bar or to demonstrate uh, effective communication while breaking bad news using SPICE tool. So when you create your objectives here, you know, they are um, uh, like specific, they are measurable. And, you know, in that one hour of uh, learning session, you are able to achieve it. So this is where you design your objectives and your lesson plan and decide uh, the duration of the training, which faculty will be involved what resources you need and then you develop your storyboard okay your scenario what points you're going to tell in the pre if what uh, uh, how the scenario is going to progress uh, if there are uh, simulated act patients or simulated participants who are going to be patient family members giving the script to them on how they need to enact uh, if your learner is uh, communicating with them finally you implement it you dry run it before with your faculty or colleagues and then you again evaluate both your scenario and your uh, uh, lesson plan as well as you assess your learners so this is how you can plan a scenario uh, design for
communication. Now, just to be a little more specific and reinforce the fact that in your design phase, your objectives, even if it is intubation, connecting to ventilator, one non-technical objective should be there on effective communication or teamwork. So just make sure if you have four objectives, at least one objective should be on effective communication. In the when you're developing the scenario, make sure that if it, a communication is one of your objective, there should be a simulated participant or your colleague, your intern, your PG, whoever is available that time. But make sure that they have a script. Sometimes, you know, we as faculty have a tendency to go a little overboard with our, with our drama and the objective is not reached. So there should be a script as to what the simulated participant should do. Should they be defensive? And when should they cry? Should they be volatile? and how they should uh, react based on what the learner is telling. So there is a proper lesson plan and progression of the scenario. If the learner does this, the SP will do this. So that should be written down. And then when we come to the implementation and assessment, yes, we uh, pre-brief them, we tell the learners the context. Now, we don't want to trick the participants. We just want to challenge them so that they can perform adequately in a real clinical environment. Now, that's our goal as a uh, facilitator. So we tell them the context. We tell them who are the role play, who's role playing as the uh, 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 patient, who's role playing as a family member, who's, who will be the uh, person to attend a call if they call for help. And then we immerse them in the scenario and then we debrief them. Now when we immerse them in the scenario we can have our checklist to assess are they actually doing the steps what uh, whether it's your procedural skills and in this context your communication skills. How many times have they used IS bar? Have they identified the opportunity where they have to use spikes? Uh, was it was was it out of empathy? So you have a lot of checklists where you can assess them and then they reflect on what how they performed and they either unlearn, relearn, and then they decide, okay, now in a real-time environment, this is how I'm going to perform. So this is how uh, we will implement this, the learners. So coming to my last slide on how you can, what are the scenarios within a COVID context you can give to teach and assess uh, uh, effective communication. You can have a context where, you know, a healthcare provider is talking to a symptomatic patient. You can have somebody escalating the emergency or a crisis to a senior. You can have a scenario where the healthcare provider is informing the status of patient to family members. And all this need not be separate scenarios. They can be a part of a scenario where you're also teaching them in procedural skills or, you know, a knowledge domain where you want to them to follow the primary uh, survey you know, those things, but make sure that this is also one context where uh, communication objective can be assessed. Hand off to the ICU from the ward uh, uh, can be or hand off during morning shift and evening shift can be. And in the ICU, how they assess and if there is an issue, how they escalate it. So these are one, some, a few of the scenarios and healthcare provider participating as a team le uh, leader during a team. So you give them a scenario of a sudden desaturation and how they are uh, arrest in the ICU post uh, intubation or anything. An arrhythmia is seen. So how, how do you, so you can assess their communication. You can assess their closed loop here, their call out here. So these are just a few scenarios where even counseling can you can add it on these are just examples to get you all thinking on what you can do and uh, uh, definitely breaking bad news to a, a family member so these are the few examples of uh, settings you can do to teach and assess effective communication within a COVID-19 context with that I end this session and if you'll have any queries, please do contact Jivaraksha and they will uh, uh, contact me or any of the faculty and we will address your queries. So thank you so much uh, for your patient hearing.